And now we are going to the next speaker. It's Jay Stevens. I see he is in the room. Um, please start sharing your slides. Jay will talk about machine learning again. His talk is Painless Machine Learning in Production. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, and greetings from Boston. Um, so uh, as Martin just said in the introduction, uh, my name is Chase. Uh, I am a uh, engineer at a company called Take a Metrics. Uh, I've been working there for about the last three years or so um, as uh, the tech lead for the data science team. Um, I'm very excited to be talking about this topic. Um, so I'll just get started. Um, First of all, I just wanted to um, help clarify, well, what is the um, point of this talk? What am I going to be um, introducing you to? If you read the description, you know that um, the talk is going to be essentially about the um, internal machine learning platform that we use at Take Metrics. Um, but I just wanted to clarify, like, what specifically about that am I going to be talking about? And um, this is not a machine learning talk, right? This is not about painless machine learning in production. It's about painless machine learning in production. It's going to be much more about um, sort of taking models, which are sort of our bread and butter as data scientists or machine learning practitioners. We have that pretty down pat, but taking the models and bring them into this sort of productionized environment where um, internal stakeholders can use them or internal consumers, or we can expose them to the rest of the world um, is something that we maybe need to mature a little in. So that's what this talk is going to focus on. Also uh, to Martin's point, um, I say this is painless machine learning in production. That's maybe a, a lofty goal. Um, when I say painless, don't, don't think of that as like expressionless or um, colorless. Think more like stainless steel, right? Where it's not going to be um, a description of a totally pain-free utopia that we built uh, at my company, but it's rather more of a um, pain-resistant um, sort of platform that we've built. So. Given these sort of caveats, I did consider other names for the uh, talk, but somehow I thought this wouldn't attract as many um, as many attendees. So painless machine learning in production it is. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the company, and this will hopefully help um, sort of contextualize why we have this machine learning platform, what we needed it for, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and this is not, hopefully, not going to be your typical like shill for the company. Um, but really, it's more about um, some of the intrinsic problems that we face in our space. So um, Tegametric's goal is essentially to help sellers um, on um, all sorts of e-commerce platforms manage their businesses and sort of optimize um, for profitability, I guess you would say. Um, if you're someone who has a product, either you know a, a very small business or perhaps a single entrepreneur, all the way up to very sort of large businesses. If you have a product, the things that you want to think about are like, you know, improving that product. Um, how are sales doing? How am I um, doing against my competition? What are like new opportunities in the market? These are the sort of things that you're probably really good at and really would like to focus on. Um, Unfortunately, <laughs> the reality of e-commerce today is that there's a bunch of sort of extrinsic things that you also have to worry about. Um, and that's sort of where we come in, right? We're trying to sort of smooth over that process and give you as much insight and as much empowerment as you possibly can have as a seller, right? And so the sort of things I'm talking about are things like managing your advertising spend, right? It's just not going to be an interesting <laughs> an interesting problem for, for most people, or maybe not something that people are going to be um, that, um, that proficient at, right? Um, things like predicting what the demand for your um, product is going to be over the next six months, right? Managing the inventory and warehousing. These are the sorts of things where um, you, you really do need a machine learning solution. And um, the average seller is just not going to be either have access to the data to produce that sort of solution or frankly probably not going to um, be sophisticated enough or have the the right background to sort of tackle those um, tackle those sorts of problems as effectively as they might like um, the other thing that I guess um, will help sort of situate this talk is um, we're a we're a fairly small um, Boston based startup although we have offices all over the world now um, and like I said, I, I joined three years ago. When I joined, it was about three or so people on the data science team. So a, a very, very small team. Um, 
I think um, two years ago when we started sort of building this machine learning platform, it was around um, four or five people. Um, now we're at about 11 people and hoping to double the size of the team by the end of the year. Um, so if you find this talk uh, very fascinating and want to get in on this stuff, um, there are openings available. But, you know, the, I guess, central conceit here is we've developed this to sort of um, help our, our relatively small team be much more effective than we might otherwise be. And it's really, over the past couple of years, um, accelerated the um, amount of work we've been able to do and the sort of solutions we've been able to develop. Um, but in addition to that, you know, like I said, a pretty small team, and we haven't been working on it continuously for the past two years. We've been working sort of piecemeal here and there. We've probably put in, you know, a collective, I don't know, um, let's say nine to 12 developer months um, into developing this platform. So um, the point being that um, regardless of the size of your organization, whether you also are working at a, a startup or whether you're working at like a Fortune 500 company, some of the principles that I'm going to be um, talking about and the technologies that we use are something that you can employ yourselves, right? This is not like a solution that's been developed by, you know, uh, one of your big tech giants. Um, so in terms of what I'm actually <laughs> going to be talking about in the talk, um, first, I'm going to try and convince everyone to actually continue listening and <laughs> motivate the rest of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm then going to talk about, well, if you are a data scientist at, at Takeometrics, what is your experience uh, when you start developing a new model? And I should say that um, for the purposes of this talk, essentially all the models we develop, um, we expose as internal services. So everything is an endpoint that you can hit and query and get a response back from. Um, then I'm going to talk about sort of the stack that helps power that, some of the tools and technologies we're using. I'm not going to go too in depth um, about that. That's you know, this talk is really more focused on, I guess, the, um, the mechanics, the um, developer ergonomics, and sort of the um, general guiding principles rather than the nitty gritty. So I'm not going to be showing you any code, but hopefully it should be an interesting reference um, if you would like to develop a similar, um, I guess, solution at your organization. And then the last thing I want to cover is basically um, what are the, the lessons that we've learned over the past two years, or what are things we might have done differently, or I guess, how did we evolve the platform to the state it's in today? So without any further ado, um, first, there are a couple of, I guess, premises to this talk that um, will help motivate um, why I'm giving it and why we sort of need this, um, this solution. So um, I'll, I'll help justify these later on, but for now, let's just assume these things are true. First of all, um, ops is intrinsic to ML. And what I mean by ops is I mean, sort of the um, process of bringing your machine learning model into production and monitoring, maintaining that model. It's, it's really direly important for having an effective machine learning solution. Um, in addition to that, um, there's this concept called MLOps, which is unsustainable. And when I say MLOps, I mean sort of this, this concept of, um, well, you have the, data scientists or machine learning practitioners or, or what have you, they know how to do data science stuff and develop the algorithms and whatever those data scientists do. And when they're done with that, you take whatever solution they developed and you hand it off to someone else and they are the ones uh, who maybe have a little more engineering background or a little more experience that take it and expose it to the rest of the world or integrate with other services or, or what have you. Um, so assuming these two premises are true, um, the sort of inevitable conclusion is that, um, well, if the MLOps team isn't a sustainable practice, uh, but operations are important to machine learning intrinsically, then data scientists need to be able to productionize their own models, right? Data scientists need to have the tooling and, and be empowered to take things from conceptualization all the way through to production. There's a catch, though. Uh, data scientists want to do data science, and I won't help motivate this one, um, but this hopefully should be pretty uncontroversial, right? Um, as data scientists or machine learning practitioners, the thing that we are best at and the thing that we find most interesting is, you know, sort of getting down to the nitty gritty and developing new, innovative, interesting solutions, right? 
people come into data science from all sorts of different backgrounds with all sorts of different levels of, I guess, engineering expertise or experience. And um, we can't uniformly assume that every data scientist is going to know the best route forward to bring a model into production. So hence, we need to develop these sort of um, tooling and services to really minimize the overhead, minimize the pain, and um, make it so that that whole process is, is easy. So now I'd like to start justifying those first two premises. Um, I'm sure people have seen diagrams like this a million times, but I'll just, I'll just go through it. Um, this is sort of the um, platonic ideal of the machine learning life cycle, right? And so the idea roughly is you have some data that lives somewhere in like a you know, data warehouse or accessible through some APIs or something like this. And um, the first thing you need to do is take that, do some pre-processing, query those APIs or query that um, data warehouse and turn it into you know, a, a training set, a test set, a validation set, all that sort of good stuff. Maybe do some feature engineering, maybe um, some data cleaning, things like that. Then you have some, um, some model that either is off the shelf or you developed yourself that you would like to train using the training data, right? Um, after that's done, you have some set of parameters you've learned for that model, which you can then evaluate. And the evaluation might be, you know, um, some sort of manual um, evaluation, like, hey, does the accuracy of this model look good? Or it might be a comparison against an established baseline or something like this, right? And then you deploy it somehow, right? And this is sort of the step that um, I think as a discipline we haven't um, focused enough on perhaps because there's a lot of complexity in here, right? If you think about like normal software engineering, this is actually the majority of the complexity is uh, figuring out um, how to look at things like logs, monitoring, implement auto scaling, all these sorts of considerations that again, as data scientists, we don't want to have to uh, worry about or think about or really aren't our wheelhouse. And in addition to that, you have this sort of um, intrinsic orchestration component where you'd like all of this cycle to just be automated for you, basically. Um, there's also this other strange aspect where, okay, you have um, a deployed model. Why do you need to do pre-processing again? Like, why is there this little arrow from deployment to pre-processing? The answer is, you know, um, <laughs> unfortunately, the world is sort of um, pulling the rug out from under us at all times, right? Um, there are always new observations that you're making. Hopefully, whatever models or solutions you've actually deployed in production are having some effect on that world that you'd like to monitor. You might just be learning new things, right? And that, I guess, environment is constantly changing, and you need to be able to adapt your model to survive. Um, so, you know, two years ago, we had this sort of concept, which I think is, is fairly standard. Um, that we want to find a solution for. And we searched high and low for some service that lives out there in the big wide world that will just sell us this platform. And to be frank, we couldn't find it. You could find places maybe that will do the, um, offer solutions for pre-processing and training or might offer all of these, but um, don't have that orchestration component, right? Instead want you to manually run all the cells in some Jupyter notebook you, because data scientists love Jupyter notebooks you know, some, some Jupyter notebook that you have, which is just not a sustainable practice. And to sort of help evidence that. So this is a very interesting uh, chart. Um, this is basically um, a, a few different classifiers, a few different models that were learned on data at the beginning of January of 2017, right? And um, what they're trying to do is determine, or I guess uh, classify whether a particular URL is malicious or not. And you can see that at the beginning of January, they all do really well. Um, I guess this is um, their uh, area under the curve over, over time in uh, using uh, real world URLs, right? And then you see this sort of precipitous drop all of a sudden in the middle of February. If you're in an organization or if you're part of a data science team that is not constantly retraining the models on the newest, freshest data, if you aren't monitoring the accuracy of your models or um, you know, some of these operational metrics, then <laughs> this is gonna come as a big surprise to you. And all of a sudden things might start failing that you didn't expect to fail. Um, and to show this is not, I guess, a phenomenon isolated just to this one domain, 
Um, this is um, some of uh, our data, right? So the blue line here is showing you um, the daily uh, number of uh, orders for a like household cleaning product that one of our sellers um, sells. And the orange dotted line is showing you um, uh, Oxford data set, um, a measurement of um, the stringency of the coronavirus countermeasures in the United States, right? Which is sort of an aggregate of all sorts of different individual measures that have been implemented. Uh, and you can see this is sort of a correlation made in heaven, I, I guess. Um, but the um, you know, general gist of this is that if we, we're in a space where if we had learned this model uh, predicting what the uh, daily order volume, for instance, is at the uh, tail end of 2019, we wouldn't be doing very well come the middle of March, right? Um, and this, um, this sort of pervades into a whole different, uh, a whole different set of domains. Um, all, all sorts of use cases um, have the same sort of pattern. It's not just this sort of time series data or not just um, necessarily because the world is sort of stochastic and, and changing out from underneath you, but also, you know, you, anytime you have a new client or a new user or a new customer or a new use case for the model, you might have the same problem. Again, um, in, in our domain, we have some models that we learn on a marketplace specific basis. We learn parameters on a marketplace specific basis where a marketplace might be um, Great Britain or, you know, um, Germany or the US or wherever. And, um, you know, for instance, suppose it's the case that um, we only have one seller in that marketplace and they sell, I don't know, pencils for, you know, 10 cents a piece, something like this. Um, and then tomorrow we have a new seller that's selling, lu that's selling luxury um, watches for $500 up, right? The parameters they've learned for that first seller aren't necessarily going to apply to the second seller. So we constantly need to be retraining, reevaluating these models and uh, measuring the performance of them. And that's why it's so, so um, important to have a good grasp and a good platform for easily enabling um, sort of these whole operational um, world that you, you might like to have some system to orchestrate for you. Um, I also wanted to talk about why do I think uh, machine learning operations is an unsustainable practice? And let's go a little bit back in time. Let's say you're a, a hotshot uh, developer in the 1970s, right? What is your what does your day to day look like? Well, um, you uh, write your code onto punch cards, uh, and when you want to have that code run or when you want to compile it, what do you do? Well, you take a, the stack of punch cards that you've written, and you go down to the um, computer lab, and you hand it over to some computer operator because in the 1970s. Well, programmers, uh, <laughs> programmers can't be trusted with computers, right? That's a ridiculous notion. Why, uh, you know, the programmer doesn't know how to run the punch cards through the mainframe. They, they don't know, you know, how to figure out, oh, this transistor's blown, I need to replace it. None, none of those things. You would never have a programmer touching the, the, the computer. That's a very odd notion. Um, and so what was, what did people at the time think about this? And this uh, next slide, these are all real quotes that I've pulled from um, uh, different accounts of people that are working in the 1970s using this sort of um, punch card flow, I guess. Um, and they're pretty amusing, but it was, it was not a great experience. So um, for instance, this middle uh, quote here, I think um, helps sort of justify what I was just saying. Only a select few programmers were allowed in the computer lab. Again, there was this very odd division. Um, but as you sort of read through the, some of these, they're pretty insidious accounts um, or very, I guess, poor development experiences where the um, latency of you submitting that program and getting back the output or the compiled program or whatever is on the order of hours, days. There's one account here where um, someone's doing something for a final exam and uh, they have four days before the deadline and they can only comp compile it four times. And if it happens to be the case that you forgot a semicolon or something like that, well, try again next time, right? So um, how, did we, how did we end up move, <laughs> moving past this into a, I guess, more um, humane um, ergonomic environment for development? And the answer was the advent of this sort of um, dumb terminal, right? So I can directly connect to the mainframe. I have some time on that mainframe. 
um, and uh, I can just run the programs myself. I don't have to have this intermediary that's um, helping me compile my programs. Um, so there was an advancement in technology, but that was also met with, um, I guess, uh, change in the skill set that was expected of programmers. So it wasn't uh, sufficient anymore to just know how to write the program. You also had to, you know, get familiar with the command line and all these sorts of things, figure out how to compile your program. Um, so it was sort of this, this mesh, or we met in the middle a little bit. Um, and of course we learned our lesson. Uh, so we never had anything like this happen again. So now let's say that you're a, a programmer in like the, uh, the heady early web days, right? Your life is pretty sweet. Uh, what do you do? Uh, you code, um, then do you write unit tests or anything like that? No, of course not. You have a QA team and you give uh, your, your solution to the QA team. They write in some sort of environment and they go, okay, it looks good for release. And then they pass it along to, you know, your like sysadmin or IT team or whomever um, that's going to release it. Easy peasy, right? You're living in the lap of luxury except that sometimes <laughs> there are problems, right? So um, you uh, maybe uh, were using a functionality in PHP that uh, is not actually installed on the server or, you know, whatever. And, you know, fundamentally, this was an insurmountable obstacle. Obviously, you don't have the people doing the coding also doing the releasing because coders don't know how to, I don't know, install RPM packages or update OpenSSL or uh, configure Apache or anything like that, right? So you just don't have the same skill set and you wouldn't want those same people doing it. But again, over time, we sort of remedied this, um, this situation um, through the advent of services like AWS, where all of a sudden, hey, at least I don't have to actually physically put a server in some like co-located data center. I can just spin up a box, I guess, and uh, start installing things on that box, which is great. And then we got a little further along and you have services like Heroku that is sort of one level of abstraction higher where now I don't even have to know, you know how to install things on my box or anything like that. I don't have to worry about security patches or, or any of those sort of operational concerns. Um, this service will take care of it for me. And then of course, there are things like Squarespace or um, Wix or whatever, where you don't even have to know how to code, right? You can make a web app or what have you pretty easily. Um, but again, um, this wasn't just technological solutions um, helping us gloss over this problem. You also had a commensurate increase in the, I guess, um, set of responsibilities or the remit of the average developer. Um, developer, software engineers, I guess, today have um, a lot more skills about, you know, things like dockerization or um, managing web server configurations than they used to. And so again, it was sort of this, let's meet in the middle, scale up a little bit, but also significantly reduce the amount of uh, work that you have to do or the amount of pain that you have to encounter when trying to deploy things to production or when trying to release things. So obviously, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. As an industry, we've gone, uh, pass this and we'll never make the same mistake again. Or so I thought, <laughs> imagine my surprise when um, just last year I was at a, a big data conference and uh, I heard a lot of, I guess, industry leaders from very large tech companies talking about ML ops. And the idea behind ML ops is of course, well, you have your data scientists, but they don't know anything about deploying things into production. So you need to have this other team to, um, to help them do that. And, you know, uh, we had our, at Take a Metrics our own dalliance with this. Um, and I just want to, I guess, uh, recount how that went. So we only ever tried it once with one model, but we thought at the beginning of some quarter, well, maybe things will work a little bit better. Maybe things will go smoother if we sort of split the team up and have a research division and an engineering division. And the researchers can focus on the, the you know, real meat of the modeling, and then they can hand the solution off to this sort of engineering team who will productionize it. All right, so we tried this. How'd it go? Well, the initial model was developed, 
And unfortunately, immediately there was a problem where, um, oh, they were using a data set, but actually that data is not available in production. So, you know, there's an obvious problem there. We have to account for that somehow. Okay, went back to the researchers. Try this different approach instead. I fixed the code. Um, we tried running it. We're encountering errors. Turns out, wrong version of NumPy, right? The researcher was using a particular version in their sort of uh, notebook environment, uh, which wasn't the one we were using in production boxes. Okay, okay, okay. So now it's pretty easy to correct. <laughs> it should be all set now. Ah, well, it turns out in the training set or the development set that was being used to create the model, um, this one column was entirely populated, but in production, it wasn't always the case. Okay, so back to the drawing board, try again, blah, blah, blah. Well, there were a bunch of sort of diagnostic graphs that really were uh, going to help us figure out um, why the model was performing in the way it was or help us identify ahead of time issues with the model that might be uh, arising. And uh, for whatever reason, those graphs just weren't, uh, weren't displaying when running production. Okay, so maybe we can <laughs> omit that part and get rid of it and we'll just learn to live without those. Ah, well, it turns out that our hosting provider has a like, particular timeout on the model and uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't <laughs> the processing was taking longer than that timeout. And by this time, and I, I don't joke when I say this, there was already a new version of the model that the researcher had developed. And so this particular version never made its way into production. And um, again, I, I wanna emphasize that just like the punch card example, each of these steps was um, on, the hour, on the order of hours or, or days, right? Because um, maybe the uh, researcher gets told there's an issue with the, uh, the model, but you know, they just started working on something else, so they have to revisit it a few days later, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is just sort of like operating in this way, uh, at least in my experience, is going to make you want to tear your hair out. So it's simply not a viable way forward for us at Take a Metrics or um, I think across the industry. So what's the alternative? Well, let me tell you about what it now looks like two years uh, past this point um, to develop a, a model um, at our company. So don't worry too much about reading through um, all of this uh, command line output, but the basic idea is um, you have a, a cookie cutter, which is sort of like a, a template repo. Um, that template repo is using a framework that we have developed internally. Um, and basically when you uh, start out, you're asked a few questions about the model you're developing, right? So, you know, you're asked what your, your GitHub username is and uh, what the name should be for the model. And you can see that things start um, pre-populating based off of the answers you've given before. Um, you're asked, you know, how are you going to evaluate this model? What's an appropriate validation metric? Um, you're asked, well, uh, for that validation metric, is this something you want to maximize or minimize or under what circumstances should I um, be promoting this model in comparison to a model that lives on production, let's say. Um, how many um, CPUs do you need for the model? Um, how much memory do you need during pre-processing training serving? Um, what, what's the appropriate um, test set proportion? What's the um, maximum runtime of the model? You answer these sort of pretty easy, pretty baseline questions. And what you get out of this is um, you get basically your entire repo made for you, right? Um, you have a lot of um, very useful things you wouldn't have to want to write over and over and over again, like a, a good standardized Python uh, package structure. You have uh, your CI integration, you have all these sorts of things. And really of this generated code, there are only four or so uh, files that you need to actually edit to implement your model. So what does the implementation then look like? Well, if you think back to that initial, um, I guess, model lifecycle that I showed you, it more or less maps directly onto that, right? So you have to define some function that um, does your pre-processing, which normally in our case looks like, oh, we're making some um, SQL queries, we're taking that, we're loading into a pandas data frame, we're doing manipulations on that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you then have to say, well, the training set and validation set that are produced by that pre-processing step, how do I actually train the model um, using that data? And um, how do I extract out the parameters um, that I'm going to want to uh, use when serving it, right? So this step runs, uh, you get out these sort of artifacts, which are arbitrary um, 
binaries uh, that you then are asked to um, describe how to load into a, uh, a function or a callable that um, can be invoked at serving time or on a per request basis. So three steps, obviously I'm glossing over <laughs> a lot of the code here um, because it varies on a model by model basis. But the general gist is that all these three steps are things that as um, machine learning practitioners or data scientists, you should feel fairly comfortable implementing. You do have to specify a few more things. So um, there's a config file that's generated for you. Um, most of the config file is, is pre-populated, but we also use JSON schema just to define, I guess, the, um, the request and response schemas for the service. All of our machine learning models are sort of the services that can be invoked internally at the company. Um, and this is actually beyond um, giving you some really nice properties like being able to ensure that your model conforms to these schemas and that uh, requests always conform to these schemas, that um, it has some really nice properties like when you see a PR that is implementing these schemas, uh, we can have a discussion as a team about, you know, ah, well, is this actually how this model should be shaped? Ah, do you not need this feature to be specified? Is there not this setting that we want to expose? Things like that. So as a cultural practice, this is very interesting, but also it gives you a lot of nice benefits um, as, as uh, both the developer and as um, a putative integrator with this with the service. Um, so I guess what sort of things are <laughs> provided for you um, out of all that generated code that I showed you? Well, for one, you get a, a test suite that's integrated in, in CI that is testing things that are common across all of our models, like does the pre-processing step output work with the training step? Does the training step output work with loading the model? Does the loaded model um, conform to the schemas that I just mentioned? You get this sort of um, standing lit standard linting suite. You get dockerization. You get um, CI, CD through Circle. Um, we use uh, Airflow to orchestrate that machine learning lifecycle. You don't want to have to write the DAG yourself, so the DAG is generated for you. By virtue of that, you get this training orchestration, you get automated model evaluation and promotion, you get gradual rollout. Um, you get automated rollback, you get monitoring, alerting, diagnostics, auto scaling, schema validation, data capture, health checks, cost monitoring, and all this other stuff that as a data scientist, you might not be good at, you probably don't want to do, and is ideally best handled in a uniform fashion that you don't have to think about. You just really want to distill it, your, your job, your role at the company, down to the things that you're good at, ideally. So basically, you get all, all this stuff for free. Obviously, all of this didn't exist at the beginning of the project's inception. But over time, we've added more and more features to it, incrementally, little by little. Essentially, basically, any time you have something you run into where you go, I don't want to have to do this for every model going forward, there you go. Just add to our framework. So what does the stack that powers us actually look like? Well, um, this is the, the general architecture. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this, but essentially the, the framework that we've built, like I said, is all orchestrated by Apache Airflow. <clears throat> we use Snowflake as our sort of data lake, and most of it is just sort of glue um, between various services. We happen to use primarily AWS services, but in principle, there's no reason why that platform especially um, should be, should be favored. Um, it, but essentially, this is uh, a diagram showing that exact same sort of um, life cycle that I uh, talked about before, right? You have uh, some data that's fetched from Snowflake, you pre-process it, the uh, results of that are emitted to S3, you take those files from S3 and you do training on them that emits some sort of model parameters or model artifact. You then can uh, evaluate the efficacy of that model artifact against whichever um, uh, validation metric you've chosen uh, and uh, compare that against the current model that's in production. Um, the evaluation there happens in ECS. If um, the promotion criterion says that based off of the comparison between production and your new model, you should promote it, then it gets promoted to an endpoint. Very simple stuff. And again, all of this is sort of just taken care of for you. In terms of what the rollout looks like, this is again, the same sort of very standard experience um, that you'd have if you were doing um, software development that as a, a, I guess, data science practitioners, we haven't necessarily matured into yet, right? But the general idea being that you have your two models, 
you're monitoring um, error rates, specifically four and five hundreds um, in HTTP, and you just want to gradually start shifting traffic over from one mall to another. So this is uh, FSM, but at every, every step here, you have one of three options. You can either say, well, based off the comparison, um, it looks like the new models, you know, uh, statistically indistinguishable from the old model in terms of error rate or, or better, in which case you'd like to start shifting more traffic to it. Um, or maybe it looks worse in case you'd like to roll back just to the old production model variant. Um, or uh, maybe it's the case, you know, all of our services have a uniform traffic that's uh, amortized over the entire day. Some have sort of spiky access patterns or um, and that can change depending on um, what services integrate with them over time. So it might be the case that you actually don't have enough observations to um, determine whether it's safe to continue to promote. And so you can just sort of defer and wait for, um, wait for more data to come in basically. And um, I should say that all of these steps when they are run, they're emitting things to a Slack channel that we've set up so that we can monitor this. And in the case of a rollback, um, someone is alerted so that we can investigate and figure out what the problem was. Um, like I said, this is all orchestrated through Airflow. If you're familiar with Airflow, writing the DAGs uh, can be sort of a, a drag, right? Um, so if you look at this diagram, there's about, I don't know, 50, 60 nodes here. This ends up being 1,500 lines of Airflow uh, DAG declaration code, which you don't have to write, right? The, is provided for you by virtue of our DAG generation. This is the stack we're using or some of the technologies we're using. This really isn't anything apart from bog standard. Again, the, the key thing that we've done is just sort of glue these various components together. And, and again, anytime that we've run into something where we go, that's gonna be painful later on down the line, well, um, we, we <laughs> embrace it and we try and add it as a feature to our existing um, platform. So now I wanna go over um, <laughs> some of the key, I guess, um, principles and, and things we've learned over the past two years, right? So one is, um, you know, uh, probably three months into developing this, this is what we, uh, are, the state of the platform looked like, right? So in Slack, you'd see stuff like, oh, this model has been created, we're running the validation, here are the results. And um, now the onus was uh, on the developer to, um, look at those results and say, okay, yes, this looks good. Let's promote it to the endpoint, right? And so um, the issue there is we started talking about like, okay, operationally, logistically, or you know, sort of culturally as a team, who's gonna be on the line for pressing that button? Who's gonna be on the line for making sure that when it's promoted that it's working well? Uh, who's gonna be looking at these metrics and, and, and making sure that there aren't alerts going off? And we <laughs> talked about that as a team. Uh, transpires, maybe unsurprisingly, that no one was really gung-ho about taking on that responsibility. And so, um, again, especially since we were uh, planning on scaling this to many, many models, we thought, this is unsustainable. This is going to be painful for us. Let's just have the uh, framework take care of this for us. So it was a little bit of effort to implement this sort of automated promotion and rollout. But um, at the end of the day, it's paid huge dividends. Um, also, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever used AWS before, but um, these are some of the instances you choose, you can choose from, and they say how much uh, memory and how much CPU they have. This is the full list, and actually I've cut off a little tail end of it. Uh, this all lives on one web page, and a completely different web page tells you what the prices are. So if you're trying to figure out which instance size is going to match the needs of my model and also be cheap, very painful process. Don't do that. Instead, um, we have implemented uh, basically a little tool that um, you just define what your memory and CPU requirements are, and it finds the cheapest instance size for you. So what I guess I mean to say here is that this, um, this notion of identifying painful parts of the development cycle um, isn't just for these really big architectural concepts, but also um, needs to pervade into these sort of smaller um, rocks in the shoe, if you will. And then uh, about Air, Airflow specifically, um, I just wanted to highlight, you know, we, we started out hosting our own stack using CloudFormation, and we ran into these same sort of operational issues where, hey, we didn't know uh, how many workers provision or all this sort of stuff. We ended up just having someone host it for us. So don't be precious about the things you've built. If something is really not um, within your wheelhouse, give it away. 
there are also issues with deployment interruptions and um, sort of these issues with um, different contributed operators not always being um, exactly what you want. So um, I guess just do do your due diligence if you're going to use Airflow um, and make sure that things will integrate the way you're expecting. But the bottom line here essentially is um, if you want to achieve the same sort of thing um, that we have where you <laughs> minimize the painfulness, um, you have to start solving the things that are painful and um, as a team, dedicate yourselves to um, making the developer experience and ergonomics as uh, simple and enjoyable as possible. And uh, that's all I wanted to leave you with. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chase. Very interesting talk. Um, the questions are coming in. The burning question <laughs> everyone is asking probably is your Python logo in the background. Ah. <laughs> um, so, so this is actually uh, from a, a local artist in, in Massachusetts. But if you go to um, bluefrogcollective.com, um, those are those are the people that um, I had uh, commissioned this for me. So um, they uh, they did a great job. <laughs> So one comment is awesome talk. It's not really a question. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, let me answer that. Um, according to your architecture, most ML is happening on Amazon Cloud. Where did you deploy Airflow? Yeah, so um, like I alluded to, we initially were also deploying uh, Airflow on AWS through, um, through CloudFormation. Um, the hosted service we're using is astronomer.io. They've been really great so far, and it's really reassuring to have um, a support team that you can sort of call up and ask questions for when you run into sort of these painful operational issues. So. And then the next question, um, it's a little bit cryptic, but <laughs> I, get, I think the question is, is cookie cutter better than MLOps? Well, I guess it's not um, better, but it helps you avoid having to have a dedicated MLOps team, right? The idea behind all of this is basically anything that you run into where it's painful or you think, oh my, oh my goodness, I don't want to have to deal with this when I'm developing my models. This is not what I'm interested in. Bite the bullet do it, have some sort of set of libraries or tools that you can just contribute that to. And then you've solved that problem in perpetuity for your entire team. So it's not about this is better or worse than MLOps. It's about just making the, the productionization process as painless as possible. OK, thank you very much again. Thank you.